please welcome to the stage, Josefa Regwala. Hello, good morning, everybody. You said good morning. Hey. Well, well, thank you for coming this early. I know it's early for uh, especially folks in the, on the West Coast, uh, but I appreciate it. Um, let me begin again you know, by, by thanking some, some more folks, take this opportunity to thank our amazing student volunteers. There are about 100 plus of them. They're wearing these orange t-shirts. Uh, and and, and you know, they've been fantastic. They've been helping you get to places, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so you know, please take that opportunity to thank them. Um, I'm super excited to see many of you again um, after, a, after a gap. And um, I, I truly think conferences happen uh, the magic happens when we see each other. Um, today, uh, we have another uh, packed agenda for KDD. We have uh, lots of research, uh, paper presentations, uh, invited talks uh, from the industry, ADS papers. Uh, two, two things that I want to bring to your attention is that there is a KDD cup workshop. So there were two KDD cups, uh, and, and both of those uh, workshops are happening today, uh, one after another. So if you're interested in uh, you know, blind competitions, uh, that's a lot of fun, fun to go see. And, um, and then there's an undergraduate consortium that's happening. So if you're an undergraduate student and interested, uh, please do attend that uh, consortium. Um, and finally, uh, today, tonight, uh, there is a big uh, celebration dinner. Uh, it's going to happen here uh, at, in this ballroom uh, at 6 p.m., right? And so there's going to be a dinner. There are going to be some awards given out. Um, I would encourage everyone to come. Uh, I know my city has a lot of other restaurants, but please come here. And, and, and that event uh, is uh, sponsored by Meta. There's going to be some uh, entertainment too, so please, uh, please try to make it. Um, with that, let me kick off uh, by introducing our uh, keynote uh, speaker today. Our keynote uh, speaker is uh, Professor Melin Tambe. Uh, so Professor Melin Tambe is the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of Center for Research and Computation and Society at Harvard University. Concurrently, he's also the Director uh, AI for Social Good at Google Research. He's a recipient of many awards, including Ichikai International Joint Conference on AI John McCarthy Award, AAMAS ACM Autonomous Agent Research Award, Triple AI Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award. He's a fellow of the Triple AI, and ACM. He's also the recipient of Informs Wagner Prize for Excellence in Operations Research Practice and RISC Prize for Moore's Military Operations Research Society. For his work on AI and public safety, he has received the Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award and commendations and certificates of appreciation from the US Coast Guard, Federal Air Marshal Service, and Airport Police at the city of Los Angeles. I'm super excited to have him here. I'm, I'm sure you all are. And he does really excellent research. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see, having him speak. Thank you. OK. I wanted to start by just thanking uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. And thank you all for getting up really early in the morning and being here. It's no easy task. And it's just such a joyful event to be here in person, in 3D, with all of you. So my talk is about uh, AI for Social Impact. So for the past 15 years, my team and I have been focused on advancing AI for social impact in domains of public health, conservation, and public safety and security. With the key theme of how to optimize our limited intervention resources. So as you listen to this presentation on AI for social impact, I would like uh, for you to take away three key lessons from here, three key takeaways. One is the lessons that we have learned in AI for social impact, I hope those will be useful. Second, the steps that we have followed in pushing AI systems towards social impact, I hope those would be useful. And finally, whereas this community has definitely contributed uh, to AI for social impact, I hope to outline several challenges and opportunities 
so that we could do more together for AI for social impact, and I'll come to that point a little later on. So let's start with the lessons. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. AI for social impact doesn't mean taking known AI techniques and applying them out of the box for social problems. Let's take the example of uh, public health. We have large populations to serve, limited number of public health resources. Concrete example is work we have done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. However, this work requires innovation in the area of influence maximization because the social networks are actually not known in advance. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect, but limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we have done in Uganda and Cambodia, where harnessing past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares, and for the past several years have been able to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of these snares. This work required innovation in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. In the past, in the area of public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by agencies in the United States, such as the US Coast Guard, to generate patrols in ports like New York and Boston, and for federal air marshals and others. These may seem like very different application areas, but they are all tied together because the underlying models and research is based on multi common multi-agent systems research. A second lesson is all of this work in AI for social impact requires partnerships with communities, nonprofits, and governments. We want to avoid being gatekeepers to AI technology for social impact. Lesson three is the entire data to deployment pipeline is important when we think about AI for social impact. We begin our work by immersing ourselves in the domain, trying to understand the kind of data that are available, the kind of problems that a nonprofit faces. Following that, a predictive model make predictions on which of the cases faced by a nonprofit are high risk or low risk. Since we can't intervene on all of the high risk cases, a prescriptive algorithm then makes recommendations on which cases to actually intervene on. And finally, field testing and deployment is crucial because this is AI for social impact. If we don't have social impact, then it is not AI for social impact. So with that, uh, so those set of lessons, let me provide an outline for what I'm gonna cover today. There's four projects I've selected for you. Each project is a combination of a technique and a domain. The first project comes to us from uh, Google Research India, from my team there, and is in, uh, situated in India. The others come from other parts of the world. I'll cover papers from the last five years based on this project. In this talk, I'll try to focus as much as possible on real world results. There are lots of other simulations and so forth in our papers. I'll also highlight the role of the lead PhD student of, uh, researcher by putting up their picture on the top right hand corner of the slide on which their work is shown. Okay, so on to maternal and child care. So this project is motivated by the UN Sustainable Development Target that by 2030, the maternal mortality ratio should be below 70 per 100,000 live births. Mothers dying during childbirth or soon after should be below 70. So that's the UN target. Where we are today in the world, Western Europe, the lowest, United States, the maternal mortality is obviously below the UN target, but rising. In the developing world, the rates are falling, but for example, in India, the numbers are higher than the UN target and higher than 100. And that's where we begin today. What that means concretely then is that a woman dies in childbirth every 20 minutes in India, a four out of 10 children end up being too thin or short. We are very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman, which works with 26 million beneficiaries or mothers in India and is active in 19 states in India. We are inspired by the founder of Arman, Dr. Aparna Hegde, who says that pregnancy is not a disease, childhood is not an ailment, dying due to a natural life event is not acceptable. Okay, so we met with Dr. Hegde and we realized we want to do something with AI, but what can we do and how? So finally, after discussions, we arrived at this problem of maintaining adherence to their M-Mitra mobile health program. 
So this is a program where when a mother enrolls all the way to the baby being one year old, Arman sends them voice messages, two minute voice messages, 141 of them week after week. The message may be something like, you're three months into your pregnancy, you should use this health supplement, or your baby's three months old, get them vaccinated. They've shown in randomized control trials that mothers who listen to these messages benefit significantly for themselves and their babies. So this problem is similar to a health adherence uh, problem that you may be familiar with in other settings. Whereas two million mothers have so far enrolled in this program, Arman notices that unfortunately, 30 to 40% of them may become low listeners over time. And that's where we come in. So to understand the problem we visited with Arman, we were fortunate that they took us around to the sites where they enroll women in hospitals, um, to the locations where these families live. And I've grown up in Mumbai, I understand these locations, but visiting these families firsthand and understanding their situation, and these are families that are way below the international uh, poverty line in terms of their income, it's not difficult to understand why they may become low listeners over time. So what can we do? Arman has this uh, call center, which is a limited intervention resource. They cannot call all of the mothers, but they can call some of the mothers to motivate them to stay in the program, to adhere and keep listening to these voice messages of health because they'll benefit them. The question is, who should we call? So you have a uh, 100,000 beneficiaries. You have to choose a thousand of them for service calls so as to maximize the number of health messages that are listened to. So I'll use this simple example of a, mother, uh, of a health worker and in this case, just for illustration, the health worker has five mothers under her care. Four of them shown in red have not listened to a voice message last week. And one shown in green has. And the health worker has to decide she can only do two calls. Who should I call? So she decides to call the first two. This turns out to be a good choice. Those two turn to green. They start listening to voice messages. There's another one who flips on her own to green. Now there's still two red left. So the health worker now decides, I'm going to call the two red. This, however, turns out to be a bad choice because the two who were red, not listening, remain non-listening, and those who were green also flip to red. They become non-listeners. So the challenge here is that a service call may not change a beneficiary state. A beneficiary may change state on their own, and yet we have to prioritize a thousand beneficiaries per week. So how do we solve this problem? we appeal to restless bandits, where we try to pull K out of N arms per week. So for those who may not be familiar in a restless bandit, each arm is an MDP, a Markov decision problem. In this case, the states of the MDP are bad state, that is a mother might be, a beneficiary might be in a bad state. She has not listened to a voice message or a good state. She has listened to a message. We have actions of intervening, giving a service call, or no intervention, which is a passive action. And now we have transition probabilities, which, is based, which are based on if we don't intervene, if there's a passive action, then the probability of going from a bad state, not listening to good state listening is 0.2. But when you give a service call, that probability may jump up to 0.8. So in reality, of course, we have 100,000 arms. So you can imagine there's 100,000 of these MDPs, and you have to decide which thousand to pull. This problem is known to be piece space hard. So one way to solve this problem is to use this Whittle index. So Whittle index, uh, we compute a Whittle index for each state of the arm. It gives us a ranking of all of the beneficiaries. And essentially, it's computing a benefit of intervention. More technically, it's the minimum subsidy that we can offer a passive action in a state so that the Q value of the passive and active action becomes equal. There's no out-of-the-box algorithm that can be applied to compute a Whittle index. Very fortunately, we had worked on this prob similar problem earlier, and there's an algorithm we developed by Chen et al. at Amas 2016 that we could use for this problem and choose the top K mothers. But we also need to prove indexability, not only for asymptotic optimality, but for validity of using this Whittle index approach. So all of that was done. All right, are we ready to now deploy the system? Not yet. One big problem is that the transition probabilities of these mothers themselves are not known. Uh, so how do we infer them? Fortunately, we have limited previous beneficiary data. We have for each mother features, age, income, education level, etc., and engagement sequence. She was in a bad state, didn't get a service call, remained in a bad state, or she was in a bad state, got a service call, moved on to a good state. 
So using this, we can compute transition probabilities and then cluster these passive transition probabilities and now learn a map from the beneficiary features, age, income, et cetera, to the cluster centers. So when a new beneficiary comes in, given her features, we can map her to a particular cluster center, infer transition probabilities from then we can compute a Vittel index, and then choose the top K mothers to call. So now we are ready to at least do a field test. So that's what we did next. But quickly here, clustering not only compensates for the lack of data, but it speeds up the Vittel index computation. Rather than computing Vittel index for 100,000 arms, if there's only 100 clusters, we only compute a Vittel index 100 times. So we did this study of 23,000 beneficiaries. This is the first large-scale application of restless bandage for public health. We divided the group into uh, these 23,000 into three groups, 7,667 per group, the restless bandage group, or the RMAP group, round robin group, and the current standard of care group. In each of these groups, we pulled 225 arms. That is called 225 beneficiaries. In the RMAP group, the beneficiaries were chosen to be those with the top Vittel index, 225 top Vittel indices. In the round robin group, we call the first 225, then the next 225, et cetera. And the current standard of care, no calls are going out. And now the question is, how many more health messages were listened to over the current standard of care group in each of the other groups? And here's what we find. After seven weeks on the x-axis are weeks, on the y-axis are how many more messages are listened to. The restless bandit group or the RMAP group, you can see that 600 more messages are listened to Whereas in the round robin group, there's hardly any difference. In fact, from a statistical significance perspective, the RMAG versus current standard of care is statistically significant. Round robin versus current standard of care is not significant. So what do we conclude? It's important to optimize the service calls and the RMAB, the restless bandit, cuts by 30% the drop-off rate over current standard of care. So now we are ready to deploy this system. So we did. The system is called Saheli, uh, which is deployed. I'm not going to get into details of uh, all, but it requires a lot of engineering. Saheli means friend in Hindi. It's also an acronym. This is to tell you that we work incredibly hard to get our right acronyms. 50,000 beneficiaries have so far been assisted via Saheli, and we continue to assist more. Dr. Aparna Hegde, after this deployment, points out that we are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI. There's a nice YouTube video, AI for Social Good, in partnership with Arman. I say this because a very talented team that created this video, if you wanted to take a look. I'm going to play a small clip from that video of a particular beneficiary. It's particularly satisfying because uh, this mother is speaking in Marathi, which is also my mother tongue. So building on this uh, interview with this one mother, the question was, why are these mothers listening to more due to service calls? So we surveyed 500 service call receivers. We asked them, did service call improve your listenership? So these were 500 chosen at random. 40% said no, roughly 60% said yes. Why? It turns out that they got more information on Mmitra, the mobile health program, more motivation to continue to listen. So that was the main reason. So main point being that it is important to reach out to these mothers via service calls. Could a simpler alternative have worked? Now we have so much data based on past studies and so forth, we can construct a simulation at least, and in this simulation, compare with simpler benchmarks. So we constructed a simulator, again, 23,000 beneficiaries divided into different groups. Here we are comparing the Vittel index approach based on our maps to the greedy approach. So it's a simpler approach, a random. And we, again, in simulation, simulated this uh, 225 arms per week and show that the total engagement improvement in the case of the Vittel index in simulation seems to be higher. So this gives us some evidence that the Vittel index approach actually buys us something over a greedy approach. 
Now, we want to continue to improve this system. So one idea here is decision-focused learning. To understand this, consider back the data to deployment pipeline where after getting the data, the first step is to learn mapping of features to transition probabilities. And then we do uh, top K beneficiaries. So it's a two-stage two -stage approach. First, we maximize learning accuracy, and then we optimize maximizing decision quality. However, maximizing learning accuracy may not result in maximizing decision quality. And here's actual results from Arman data which shows this. So if you look at two data sets here, predictive accuracy, data set one has a high predictive accuracy, data set two has lower. So we would have expected, given that we have better estimates of transition probabilities of mothers in data set one, that we would actually do better in terms of actual engagement results given ser with service calls. But in the actual deployment using restless bandits, what we find is the opposite. Data set one actually has lower improvements compared to data set two. So even though data set two has lower predictive accuracy, actually it led to higher engagements. So why might this happen? So this is a part of my PhD student Kai Wang's PhD work. One reason this happens is data limitations. So if you imagine here now a f some kind of a feature, this is an illustrative example on, on the x-axis, y is we are trying to infer transition probability. To the left of the orange line are all the blue dots, low risk beneficiaries on the, to the right are red dots, high risk beneficiaries. The high risk beneficiaries are very small in number here. And now we apply a two stage approach. We first try to learn as accurately as possible the transition probabilities. With the linear regressor shown with the green line, we learn a linear regressor which gives us a high learning accuracy, but it misses all the red points. And so it provides low decision quality. Decision focused learning directly modifies the loss function to maximize decision quality. What this means is you learn a linear regressor which clearly has low learning accuracy, but has much higher decision quality. And that's the idea in decision focused learning. So here we have a, a two stage, in a two stage approach, basically the gradient descent is just trying to maximize predictive accuracy. In decision-focused learning, gradient descent is actually trying to directly maximize decision quality. And there's some interesting problem there for differentiating through the optimization problem, which I'm gonna skip. But again, these are real results from our work with Arman. So two-stage two versus decision-focused. If you look at predictive accuracy alone, the two-stage approach performs better. If we look at how many more messages were listened to by the mothers based on service calls, we find that decision-focused approach leads to more engagement. And if you want to understand more about this, uh, you know, the papers at NeurIPS that Kai has been publishing, please, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can look at those. So this is something that we're going to deploy next. Uh, here, there's a difference of 90 as shown in four weeks in terms of higher engagement. But there are other approaches that can be used, for example, this idea of a robust stressless bandit. Given limited data, rather than trying to infer exact transition probabilities, we can infer intervals of transition probabilities. So ARM1, we can say, has a transition probability that's between 0.4 and 0.7. ARM2 has a probability between 0.2 and 0.4. So given these intervals, then we can approach, approach this problem as a robust, trying to solve a robust stressless bandit problem to minimize maximum regret. So our algorithm is going to try to choose ARM rankings to perform as best as possible. In nature, is trying to choose parameter setting within these intervals to get our ranking to perform as worse as possible. So we are trying to minimize the regret, and nature is trying to maximize this regret. So if you think about this as a zero-sum game, uh, in terms of the RMAP planner, the number of policies are massive, right? Because you have 100,000 mothers, you're trying to choose 1,000. That's a massive number of possible policies for the planner. Nature is trying to choose parameters from a continuous interval. Nature has massive number of parameters. So if you think about this game, representing this game in memory itself is difficult, let alone trying to solve it. So we solve this problem using a double oracle approach. We initialize the game with a small number of parameters and policies, small number of strategies on both sides. Then a planner's oracle will provide its best response to the game. 
And then we have Nature's Oracle, which will provide its best response. This is getting solved using Montage and RL. And then we expand the game. And we iterate in this fashion until convergence. And often the convergence happens with a small number of iterations. You don't have to expand the whole game. And yet we arrive at an equilibrium strategy. So that's the idea behind a double Oracle approach. We've applied this in the context of Arman. Again, given the large size, we had to further do abstractions by grouping the arms. And we can show in min-max regret uh, approach leads to lower regret, that is higher number of messages being listened to. In this case, this is simulation. All the results I showed until now were actual results in the field. But we don't have to stop only at maternal and child care. The applicability of restless bandits applies to many other health adherence problems. For example, preventing tuberculosis. This is the other pandemic the world faces and is still going on. So in India alone, TB kills half a million people per year and three million people are infected. So a TB requ patient requires to be ta you're taking pills every day for six months. I get tired if uh, I'm asked to take pills for six days here for six months, that's very difficult. So again, we have a health worker who has to remind people to take their medicine. And so this, this is what happens. The health worker decides, okay, among all the patients, hundreds of patients in my care, which, which few should I call today? So in this case, the health worker has no idea whether the patient has taken their medicine or not. So the pay, health worker may say, okay, we call the first three. Two of them are green. They have taken their medicine. One is in red. They have not taken their medicine. The health worker encourages them to continue to take their medicine as to decide who to call next. This is similar to the maternal and child care problem I just showed, except the state of the patient is not known in advance. So basically, this is a challenge of partial observability. Each arm now is a POMDP. To solve this problem, we present a model called collapsing bandits in NeurIPS 20. Basically, when an arm is not called, we have a belief state that gets updated. But when an arm is called, when, when we give a service call, now the state of the patient gets revealed. So the patient says, I took my medicine last night. The state is known. Uncertainty collapses. Or my, I didn't take my medicine. Again, the state is known. Uncertainty collapses. This collapsing nature turns out to be crucial for fast algorithms and providing guarantees for indexability, which lead, allows us to make claims about optimality. So, uh, we've done simulations on this model using data from, that we obtained from uh, Mumbai. And again, we can show here that the orange, which is the best baseline, can be beaten by our model significantly in terms of runtime, giving up very little in terms of solution quality. There are many other exciting problems to think about. I mentioned earlier that I'll highlight some of the challenges and opportunities. So in KDD21, we talked about this uh, online learning. So there are problems when we have don't, don't have enough data in our maps, online learning, whether there's two actions or two plus actions, because in some cases, it's not only service call or not, but you can imagine sending text messages or going to a beneficiary's home. So there are many possible interventions. And so for that, we need a different kind of index, a multi-action index rather than the Whittle index. And so we've presented this uh, last year. But there are many other open problems in this context. So where are we going with all of this? 2023, we hope to get to 1 million beneficiaries with Arman. We are also talking with the government of India, which uh, with the program called Kilkari, which is also managed by Arman. Kilkari is 10 times the size of Arman. Similar problem, sending health messages to mothers to get them to listen. 25 million mothers or more are enrolled in Kilkari. The 5.28 crore here roughly translates to 52 million messages being sent. So you can imagine the scale of this problem. And so this is something that's tremendously inviting in terms of the kinds of research challenges it's going to present. But we're also working with other NGOs. In EMO21, we presented work with Kushi Baby, which works with malnutrition in India. And in HKI22, with Help Mum in Nigeria, which is a nonprofit where we worked on with them, in this case in simulation, improving vaccination rates among children. So let me now switch over to a second project here, which is HIV prevention using social networks. So this is work I did while I was in Los Angeles uh, at USC. And the problem that we worked on there with our School of Social Work was uh, preventing HIV amongst youth experiencing homelessness. 
There's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles every night. The rates of HIV in this population are 10 times the rates of the normal house population. So homeless shelters, drop-in centers want to reduce this rate, but they can't go and talk to every single youth. So they invite peer leaders, educate them about HIV prevention, expect these youth to talk to their friends and their friends to talk to their friends, and in this way, information to spread in the social network. Now, this is real face-to-face -face interaction. This is not happening over Facebook, etc. So the problem is that we have this social network. Each number here represents a youth. Each red line is an edge, a friendship edge between two youth. And now we have to choose key influencers. This is a picture from one of our colleagues in the School of Social Work actually educating the influencers that were selected by our algorithm. So we want to select peer leader nodes to maximize the expected number of influence nodes. And information here is supposed to spread via this independent cascade model. So if a youth C gets educated about HIV prevention, then a neighboring youth D will be informed with the probability 0.4 about HIV prevention. If D is informed, then node E will be informed with the probability of 0.4. So what, if we take algorithms that have already been developed in the literature and try to apply them directly out of the box, here are some problems we face. Basically, there's a lot of lack of data and uncertainty. And I've come to this theme earlier also, and essentially the lesson I want to point out is that lack of data and uncertainty is a key feature of AI for social impact, and we have to figure out techniques to go and get around that. So I said the propagation probability is 0.4, but there's uncertainty about exactly the propagation probability. I said we can invite key influencers, but these are youth in difficult circumstances. One of them may get arrested on the way to the drop-in center. One of them may choose to leave town. So you can't quite expect the influencers to show up to your education session. So we need multi-step dynamic policies to recover from no-shows. And thirdly, the social network itself may be unknown. And what this means is we, have a, we can appeal to a limited query budget. We can sample a few of the youth and sample, get a small sample of the social network and work with that. I'm going to sketch some ways we solve these problems. So first, I said this probability of 0.4 may not be known. So we can say we sample this from some distribution, but the mean of the distribution itself may not be known. So we can say this lies within some interval. Now, we again face this problem of robust influence maximization. We attack this problem again by casting it as a zero-sum game against nature, where the algorithm on the one side is trying to choose peer leaders, nature on the other side is trying to choose parameter settings to cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. We are trying to maximize here, nature is trying to minimize where the payoff is the ratio of the outcome of our policy to the optimal possible had we known the parameter settings ahead of time. Now, there's details here of generating a mixed strategy and sampling a pure strategy that are available in our paper. I'm going to skip those. Again, to solve the problem, same challenge that we face. The number of strategies from the influencer and nature are massive. And so again, we appeal to the double oracle approach. The key, this may seem similar to the earlier problem, of course, it's the general double oracle approach, but every time there has to be innovation in how the oracles get designed. In fact, this workup happened earlier than the earlier work I presented. Uh, which was at uh, UAI 22. So using this double oracle approach, in a small number of iterations, we can arrive at a robust influence maximization strategy without expanding the whole game. And yet we can provide, converge, we can converge with approximation guarantees. The second problem I mentioned is that the network itself is not known. So we can imagine we send our social work colleagues to a homeless shelter and say the network is not known, go survey all the youth, they spend a week, two weeks there and find out who's friends with whom. We could do that, but this is very costly. And in fact, if you want to take this program to other cities, this is not going to work. So if we can come up with a technique where we sample a small fraction of this network, say 15% of the youth, we go and ask them, who are your top five friends? And given this small sample, we then choose peer leaders, K peer leaders, to spread influence. And the goal here is to perform similar to the optimal possible had we known the entire social network ahead of time. So we do this by this uh, sampling algorithm. We sample nodes randomly and then estimate the sizes of the communities that the nodes belong to and then choose seeds from the largest K communities. 
We can provide some performance guarantees of this algorithm, but let me now turn to the actual experiment that we ran. This is this change algorithm which we have, which is based on network sampling, has robust policies, and then selects peer leaders. And so we did this study with the 750 youth experiencing homelessness with Professor Eric Rice in USC School of Social Work. So there were three arms in the study, 250 youth were in the change arm. So peer leaders were selected using change. 250 were covered by degree centrality. This is the traditional approach. Bring in the most popular youth, which seems logical, and educate them about HIV prevention. And 250 were in control group. There was no spreading of any messages here. And now we want to see what is the actual reduction in HIV risk behaviors. So this is again a first large scale application of influence maximization for public health. This is a work done in collaboration with homeless drop-in centers in Los Angeles, my friend's place, Los Angeles LGBT Center and Safe Place for Youth. And what we are trying to study is, is there an actual reduction in HIV risk behavior? So we select peer leaders and then wait a month and then wait three months and see what was the reduction. So with respect to condomless anal sex, which is one of the HIV risk behaviors with change, there is more than 30% reduction in this behavior. But with degree centrality and control group, there's no, no reduction. At the end of three months, we have change, uh, degree centrality catching up with change, but change is still better. And the fact that change was able to cause this reduction faster is important because this is ultimately a risk behavior. And furthermore, this is a community where youth come and go, and therefore having this reduction happen faster is important. We also looked at other risk behaviors, reduction in condomless vaginal sex, and again, we see that change outperforms degree centrality. There are statistical significance results in our AAAI and Journal of AIDS papers if you wanted to take a look. Here's what our collaborator had to say. Way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. So in terms of next steps here, one is this problem of fairness in influence maximization. Influence maximization can lead to disparities among different groups within the network. And so to achieve fairness, we've explored ideas from max min fairness, which maximizes minimum utility of any community. Diversity constraints is an idea borrowed from cooperative game theory, but more recently an idea of inequity aversion where we give a parameter for, to the policymaker to control so they can control the trade-off between fairness and performance is what we have favored. We are also exploring ideas based on reinforcement learning. This is with uh, my colleague and collaborator Ravindran uh, from IIT Madras. So could we use reinforcement learning for network sampling? and? Also to speed up influence maximize, we train the RL algorithm based on past networks to, to figure out who are the influencers. And then in real time, we just use the policy rather than trying to solve the problem. It achieves similar performance to change, but can be run much, much faster. So these are ideas we are exploring right now. These are results from simulations, but combining these algorithms and testing them in the field remains an exciting issue for future work. The third topic I wanted to go over is this uh, agent-based modeling for COVID-19 dynamics. So, you know, let's go back to 2020. These papers are from 2020, 2021. So after the world got shut down uh, due to COVID, we started collaborating with our faculty members in the Chan School of Public Health. So there's an article in PNAS, one in Science Advances. I'm going to highlight one in Science Advances. The main point here is to highlight the value of agent-based simulation models in terms of providing social impact or in terms of being able to address some of the challenges we face. I highlight this because this is, a, this is the paper that often gets uh, referenced in popular media. So, Professor Michael Mina in the Harvard School of Public Health approached us with this idea of using agent-based modeling to figure out what is the right COVID testing policy. So at the time, of course, there's the PCR, gold standard, we're all familiar with it, which detects very low viral concentration, but the cost was very high, and the results would come back only after 24 hours. And then we have something like the antigen strip, which 
requires higher viral concentrations to detect, but low cost, and we get back results in a rapid manner. So if you're Harvard and you're trying to decide, which is what Michael was struggling with at this point, and saying, okay, we're gonna test all our students, should it be the PCR test or should we be using these rapid tests? And so we did agent-based simulations, and in the first, at first, the idea was that we would test all the population every three days. On the y-axis are total infections, and anybody who's positive, we isolate. If we can do testing every three days and isolate positive individuals, and we get back results instantaneously, then it turns out that the rapid tests are actually worse. However, we know in reality the PCR tests actually may have a day delay in getting results back. So they delay in isolating a positive individual. With that one day delay, the advantage of the PCR test is lost. The number of infections are higher than ones with the rapid tests. Furthermore, because of cost, if we say we can only run the PCR test every five days instead of every three days, again, delay in isolating positive individuals, the advantage of the PCR test is lost. The point being that rapid turnaround time and frequency is more critical for COVID-19 surveillance rather than sensitivity. So the rapid tests actually have a great value for COVID-19 surveillance. And that was the point. This story was, this paper that we wrote was picked up by New York Times and Washington Post and Time and so forth. One day we were surprised to wake up in the morning and find Dr. Fauci discussing our paper. And all credit to Michael Mina for his advocacy of rapid tests. He's been a great leader on this front. And finally now, of course, uh, rapid tests are FDA approved and they are available for free and so on and so forth. All right, so let me now turn to the final topic I want to cover today, which is conservation. So in national parks around the globe, there's wonderful wildlife. This is my picture from Uganda. This is uh, from Queen Elizabeth National Park. And these are sna snares, uh, wire snares. These are also my pictures. So these snares get placed by the thousands in national parks around the globe to try to maim and kill wildlife. Rangers have to search thousands of square kilometers. There are a small number of rangers searching this vast land, trying to find where the snares are hidden and remove them. So to assist these rangers, you can imagine dividing up the park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square and then predicting what are the hotspots, where can we remove these snares from. So that's what we did. So we got 14 years of data from Uganda, and this includes for each grid square, range of patrol frequency, animal density, distance to rivers, roads, and villages, whether there was a snare in that grid or not, et cetera. And based on that then, the question was, can we predict the probability of a snare being there per one kilometer grid square? There's an ensemble model that we built. I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time. I see about 10 minutes left here. So we did lots of tests in the lab, but our colleagues and collaborators in Wildlife Conservation Society, et cetera, were not convinced. They wanted a field test in the real world. And their condition was that the field test must predict new locations where snares have not been found. So this test was conducted in Queen Elizabeth in fall of 2016. We predicted two nine square kilometer areas that were infrequently patrolled. Nothing had been found there. They were not patrolled before. And you can see these green dots are the ones we predicted, and they don't overlap with the red dots where previously snares had been found. And we asked rangers to go patrol them for one month, and you're going to find something. So you can imagine uh, this is a pretty stressful situation. To make the situation, so here's the rangers. I mean, these are pictures from them trying to look for snares. And just to make the situation more interesting, this test was one month before the AMAS conference deadline, which meant if snares are found, we are going to have a paper. If no snares, no paper. And rangers patrolled, and every day they would send us an email, what happened today, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then they said they had found a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. We were too late to save this elephant. However, at least the machine learning system was pointing us in the right direction. Then they said next day they found a whole elephant snare roll and removed it. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, a whole elephant snare roll was removed. Then 10 antelope snares were found. Honestly, I had very low expectations about what might happen, so I had promised the students involved a free drink for every snare found. At this point, they were like, we don't want, we don't want any more. 
This success then led us to do a more detailed test. So this was done in three national parks, Queen Elizabeth and Murchison Falls in Uganda, Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia. In each park, we selected 24 areas. Some of them we predicted were high risk areas, some we predicted were low risk areas. And this is what the system we built is now called PAWS, and PAWS made all of these predictions. And now we ask rangers to go and patrol these for six months and come back with the results. Of course, the rangers didn't know which area was which. They were just asked to patrol these and come back. And indeed, where we predicted high risk, more snares were found. Where we predicted low risk, less snares were found. So this allows us to say it's not just if you haven't patrolled an area, you go there, you're going to find snares. It's that we can discriminate amongst different areas of risk. In the Sripak Wildlife Sanctuary, these are pictures from snare captures based on PAWS. 2018, before PAWS, 100, 100 snares per month, roughly. After PAWS, more than 500 snares per month. Snare capture jumped more than fivefold. In 2021 alone, 1,000 snares were found per month in, in March. So I have so far discussed this idea of prediction, but there's also prescription of how to patrol. So for example, uh, not only do we want to make hotspot recommendations, but exactly where to patrol. So if I imagine that we've made predictions that there's two hotspots, the red spot and the orange spot, orange is perhaps not as high risk, and we ask rangers to go patrol, they always go to the red spot, the poachers are gonna figure this out and move to another spot. So we, this problem needs to be addressed by randomizing patrols of rangers. And to that end, we've approached this problem using a Sackleberg security game model that I mentioned earlier, except that the poachers here are boundedly rational, so they're not playing a fully strategic game. So this is something that my student Lily Shu has been exploring. There's a UAI 21 paper if you are interested. But collectively, with the prediction and the and the prescription, the PAWS system has now gone global. SMART is this platform of 13 wildlife conservation agencies, WWF, WCS, and others. And they have the software that gets used by rangers across the globe to where they record all of the poaching incidents. So across the globe, people are using, rangers are using SMART. PAWS is now integrated with SMART. What this means is as data becomes available, rangers can use PAWS to make predictions on where the hotspots are around the globe. And it's been very exciting. So this is now pause potentially playing a role in 1,000 national parks around the globe. And indeed, people are testing our software, and it's very exciting to see messages coming in from around the globe as to what is happening with pause. In 2022 alone, we had these collaborators from Belize, uh, from Zambia, and Vietnam. Our team was just in Belize doing a field test with PAWS, and these are some pictures from them on patrol and pointing out where the snares are. But there's lots of new research to be done here as well. I talked about so far parks where there's a lot of data, but there are parks where we have data scarcity. For example, in this Royal Bellum Park in Malaysia, not as much data. So now we want to conduct patrols not only to detect illegal activities, but also to collect data to improve predictions. So we want to exploit and explore. This is obviously a bandit problem. So we've presented a lizard multi-armed stochastic bandit algorithm. And essentially, it uses uh, decomposability and smoothness in the sense that two locations of the park that are similar in terms of feature, like slope of the land, vegetation, et cetera, will have similar features, will have similar properties. And using this, we are able to show strong performance in simulation. Another area we're exploring is integrating real-time information. So this is work that was done with a nonprofit called Air Shepherd. They fry drones in uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa. They take infrared video. This is black and white uh, video, of course. And now they want to detect poachers. The drone is flying overhead. The poachers are really tiny in this video. There's also ground heat. So detecting poachers from this video for a human being is difficult. Therefore, SPOT, which is based on CNN, automatically detects poachers and animals, and this software was given back to Air Shepherd for their use. But now that we have SPOT integrated, there's something very interesting we can do. We can play a game of deception to try to deter poaching. So the 
so drone knows not only the probability that a ranger is present at a particular spot, but the drone actually knows whether the ranger is actually present at a particular spot or not. A poacher conducting surveillance only knows the probability that the ranger is present with a probability of 0.3 or 0.2. It doesn't know actually whether the ranger is present or not for real. This information asymmetry can be used to construct a optimal deceptive signaling game, and that's what we did. So here, even when the ranger is not present, the drone can signal by turning on its light that a ranger is coming. So not only when the ranger is present will the drone turn on its light, but also when a part of the time when the ranger is not present, the drone will turn on its light to signal to a poacher that a ranger is coming and causing more deterrence. So this is, some, this is work that we have been exploring, and so this potentially real-time information can be then integrated into PAWS as well. So hopefully I've told you that there's interesting problems to be solved in the area of conservation as well, but now I've come to the end of my presentation, and let me go back to the points I mentioned as the key takeaways. First are the lessons to be learned that we have learned and hope that may be, of infor that may be informative. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. It's not just a matter of taking solutions out of the box and applying it. You need new research, as I've hopefully shown, for example, with uh, social networks, influence maximization, where there is no social network in hand in the first place. Secondly, partnerships with nonprofits, governments, and local communities crucial in AI for social impact. Third, we don't want to be engaged in helicopter science with AI for social impact. Take the data from these communities publish a paper and run away. We want to stay engaged for the long haul and really show impact, to achieve impact. The whole data to deployment pipeline is important. It's not just about improving algorithms. And so for scientists who are involved in AI for social impact, innovation in all parts of the pipeline are important. It's not just about making incremental changes to existing algorithms. It's important to step out of the lab and into the field. I can tell you many examples where, you know, sitting in our lab, we may tell rangers, hey, why don't you walk just straight line? You know, why, is, why don't you walk in straight lines? When you go there in reality and patrol with them, you say it's a very hilly terrain. They, ha they can't walk in a straight line. So these are things that only become apparent if you go out in the field. It's important to embrace interdisciplinary work, whether with social work or with conservation scientists. And finally, lack of data or limited data is a norm, a feature, and should be part of a project strategy. So I want to now turn to the second point I wanted to make. Uh, hopefully I have highlighted challenges and opportunities in AI for social impact. As I said, this community has already contributed a lot in AI for social impact, but with these challenges and opportunities, I hope I've convinced you that together we can do more and I humbly request that there be a special track on AI for social impact at KDD in the future. So I'll, that's it. Uh, I'm going to end my lecture here. Uh, if you wanted to contact me, those are my email addresses. And thank you very much for waking up early in the morning and showing up here. Thank you. Exciting, um, exciting work, Milan. Um, and you know, I'm certainly inspired. I'm sure many of uh, many in the rooms uh, are inspired too. Uh, we'll take questions if you could use the mics. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kumar, uh, Milan, fantastic talk, very inspiring, and uh, uh, you laid out the challenges and and, and 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 showed what can be done with sustained effort. It's not something, as you said, helicopter science uh, in which you come in, get the data, and work get done. So a couple of related questions here. Uh, one of them is, and, and as you said, your, your call is for this community to get involved. And then I, again, uh, you alone with a small number of collaborators, you've done so much. If more people get involved, a lot more can be done, right? But for better or worse, this community is driven by benchmarks. Uh, and good benchmarks can drive the community in the right direction. And overuse of them can lead to uh, incremental changes. So what possibilities do you see here of, uh, even though you, know, you want to make sure you people are aware that helicopter science is not the way to go, but what opportunities do you see in creating some benchmarks 
which of course you know would sort of be bordering on the helicopter size but may have the opportunity here listening to you in the last one hour of creating some entirely new problem formulations as well you know for example you sort of said there are situations there is no social network right? and one thing would be to sort of see what can you do without social networks but other thing would be per, again i'm just you know listening to you would be how do you work in a context like this and maybe create a imperfect social network that that might do it. i'm just giving it as an example so just want to listen to your thoughts as to so so you gave us a thought a, a thinking question i sort of say is there a possibility for, for you to be able to help us here a little bit more so the community could come and and, and sort of uh, you know work together you know on problems like this which are increasingly important and for all of us that's a, a excellent question thank you uh, vipin your papers have uh, inspired me even when uh, i was an undergraduate student so thank you uh, for the for those kind words uh, there's lots of uh, thoughts uh, in response you're right that we you know as an academic community as a research community respond to the you know the reward system that is in academia or you know what papers get accepted will turn you know uh, inspire people to write different kinds of papers i may again very humbly point out uh, the ai for social impact track at triple ai where the evaluation criteria are very different to the main track the evaluation criteria there are if you innovate in how you collect data that's counted if you do a novel experiment in the field and even if the algorithms are just out of the box and you show something interesting as an outcome the reviewers won't say like oh where you know where is the innovation in the algorithmic front they'll say they'll accept the fact that this was a new experiment done and so if there is a evaluation criteria that are not strictly based on algorithmic innovations uh, that would really help and and in ai for social impact i think we have to look at the entire pipeline i may uh, provide a, a small pitch to a program i run at uh, google and uh, so this is a program where professors can apply nonprofits can apply and then we do matchmaking we've run this now for 2 uh, 3 years so basically uh, there's a call that was done for north america or the, or the americas recently so if you apply as a faculty member we match you with three nonprofits from different parts of the world where uh, if they you know and then you can write a proposal with one of them uh, as, as a result of a matchmaking and the nonprofit gets to meet with three professors and you know based on matchmaking speed dating you write a proposal we fund it so that's another avenue by which to find nonprofits and benchmarks but this idea of extracting some kind of benchmarks from the kinds of problems we have faced or others have faced uh, and using that to to uh, push the community forward is very interesting i would love to discuss this uh, more with you i don't have those benchmarks in hand right off uh, right off my top of my head right now thank you so yes uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, if we don't find snares, we don't have a paper. But uh, shouldn't we be also publishing negative results too? That's a, yeah, there was a, a bit, uh, my, my attempt to make a joke here, but uh, I agree with you that, uh, you know, this is uh, important. And pointing out, uh, you know, these neg, I mean, honestly, if our venues uh, are like the AI for social impact, I mean, you know, a, venues where we encourage these kinds of results also being published, uh, that would be very interesting. There was this workshop and what didn't work and why, uh, you know, where people just published like, I tried this, it didn't work and why it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so if th things like that would be very helpful for the community as well. But you're right. I mean, I, I agree with you that uh, being able to highlight not only what worked but what didn't work would be important in this case fortunately we did find those snares yeah. but uh, excuse my attempt to uh, make a joke there okay thank you thank you for your talk so thank you uh, thank you very impressive work uh, i'm here uh, so i'm um, uh, interesting when we have a relatively large data set we find that uh, the data can be quite imbalanced for uh, <clears throat> normal people we have quite a lot of data but for vulnerable people the data quality and the quantity can be much lower than the rest of the group. Uh, so we really worry about that. So in your opinion, so what will be the most effective way uh, to collect the data for the vulnerable people 
And uh, if we have limited funding resources, so should we focus, like your A study, focus on a small group of people, collect more sophisticated features, or we uh, spend more time with more general people, get more data, but the relatively superficial features? So what do you think is the best way? Uh, because it's really, really hard to collect the, you know, data for vulnerable people. I think it's an excellent question. It's hard to give a very general answer. In our colleagues in social work, when we've worked with them on challenges such as suicide prevention and so forth, we find that the data has very rich in terms of number of features for each individual, but the total number of uh, individuals that are there, the amount of data is that way limited. But that's the data we have, and that's what we have to live with. And I have had students who will uh, you know, look at the data and say, this is not enough, I can't do anything with it. But that's where you get your PhD, uh, you know, to, I mean, for the student I mentioned to him that that's, that's what you have to work with and show that you can do something. It's hard to give a very uh, general answer. For, for us, one of the exciting areas has been this uh, decision-focused learning. So it's what is the, you know, what are you learning for? What's the objective? And use that to drive what it is that we are trying to find. And that has allowed us to make some progress. Um, we've approached, you know, problem of lack of data using bandit algorithms, as I showed uh, in the final section of my talk, by sampling algorithms. So these are all techniques to try to deal with the lack of data and try to collect data intelligently. So with respect to your problem, um, basically I'm saying that a goal-driven approach, what, it is, what is it that we want to solve for, may help us guide towards what it kind of data we want to collect. But in some cases, we're stuck with what we have, and we have to work with what we have. Um, so I think we'll take one more question. Uh, Professor Wolf. Hi, Melon. Great talk and great work. Thank you for doing this. So in this domain, more so than in many others, the issues of trustworthiness are huge, and you touched on, upon some of them, and one of the biggest way to engender trust is to do, be there for the long haul, is to work with the community to make sure that the papers and the methods that we publish are actually implemented, deployed, tested, and uh, actually, and, and, and result in some action. But one of the biggest issues in this whole trustworthiness process is the do no harm. How do we guard against actually you know, bringing more harm with the process of data collection, the technology that we bring, the solutions that we suggest? How do we measure the impact versus any other alternatives or no alternatives? You know, even, even the fact that any deep learning method is going to take resources at the level, I mean, energy, water, rare metals, and so on, that maybe do not even improve the outcome on the ground. So your thoughts? Well, Tanya, thank you for that uh, question. Thank you for your kind remarks. So going to the last point you made there, we say that the problems we face are of low data, low compute, and low resources. And so low compute is also a, f a factor here. I, so I completely agree with you about the amount of uh, resources being available to these communities are limited. And the solutions we develop, therefore, have to be shaped by the availability of computation. So for example, in the case of the restless bandits, I mentioned that clustering helps reduce compute time. In the case of wildlife conservation, we have an ICDE paper that talks about some ensemble of uh, GPs and so forth. But in reality, when we try to implement that technique as is, the wildlife conservation organization, SMART, that we've been working with, said this is not feasible. It takes too much, uh, si too many cycles. We can't pay for this. So it had to be completely scaled down in order to be used. So the concern you express about uh, compute time and so forth are very real. And low resources, uh, obviously, we have to be careful. We can't just say fly 100 drones. There's no, no money for that. As to the other question you asked about uh, guarding and being responsible in our deployments and so forth, wonderful question. I don't think I have a one-size-fits-all answer. In all of the cases that uh, we have worked with, you know, you try to understand what impact it 
the solution you're proposing is having on the community. For example, trying to ensure fairness amongst the different groups that may be impacted by the solution that you offer, as we have tried to do uh, in the example I, sh I showed with social networks or even in the case of the bandits, I get, didn't get to it. Uh, trying to ensure that uh, people's privacy is preserved, uh, that the solution is in general so socially beneficial by repeated testing and making sure that we are not actually causing harm. But beyond these sort of uh, trying to test and, and make sure that all of the pitfalls that we know are guarded against. And this would have to be done on a case, at least in our case, is being done on a case-by-case -case basis in collaboration with the communities. And so I guess finally my answer to your general question is the answer to um, you know, safeguarding is really partnership, partnership, and partnership, which is what you mentioned. So from the beginning of the problem all the way to the end, the deployment, the testing, the evaluation. It's not us sitting somewhere in an ivory tower saying, here's, a, here's, here's my technique, technology, go use it, but rather sort of just being there, being you know, partnering with the organization, checking everything every step of the way, and making sure all of the stakeholders are satisfied. That's ultimately what we have tried to do. Thank you. All right, let's thank Milan again. Thank you. And um, uh, I'm sure he's happy to take offline questions, so please uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, there's a coffee uh, break right now. It's in the hall D at the end, so if you want to get ca coffee, that's a good time to do that. Thank you again. Thank you. KDD, hello. My name is Bayan Bruce. I lead the Applied Machine Learning Research Team at Capital One. My team and I are so excited to be here with you all, and we're thankful to KDD for continuing to bring this community together year after year. This week's conference is packed with incredibly salient and forward-leaning topics in data science and machine learning. From critical areas like gender equality, social impact, responsible AI, climate and healthcare, to important technical topics around the life cycle of data science like data set curation, representation learning, and novel methods for fitting models, as well as post hoc concerns like explainability, privacy, and deployments at scale. As the world becomes more technology focused, there is a huge opportunity for all of us in the data science and machine learning community to be protagonists in the creation of our data-driven future. At Capital One, we are working day in and day out to apply data and machine learning at scale to solve challenging problems and help improve the financial lives of millions of customers. We believe the power of technology can give customers greater protection, confidence, and control of their finances. And one of the most impactful ways for us to achieve this is through the responsible, human-centered use of real-time data